Hi everyone, this is Joe. Welcome to another episode of the Decahedron RPG Podcast. This is a continuation of last week's show where we're just doing feedback. And we left off, I think, after episode 124 or so, or right before episode 124. Uh, so we're going to pick up right there and we're going to go through. Little secret, this was recorded in two sessions. So if you're watching on YouTube, this camera angle might change a little bit. And if you're listening on the podcast, the audio uh, sound might be different. I, I don't know why that is. I mean, I record in the same room, but... Yeah, but I've noticed on different days, things just sound different. I don't know. So <clears throat> anyway, because part of this I recorded last week and I'm doing the rest today to finish up the episode. Only other thing I will mention is, did anyone else see the Aurora? Oh, that was, that was great. I've traveled to Alaska twice now trying to see the Aurora and I, I failed both times. And who knew staying right here at home? Um, it wasn't that bright. Uh, I used, you know, my phone camera and it was a whole lot brighter on my phone. That was kind of cool. But uh, when there were no cars coming, we could see it. It was like this green dancing curtain in the sky. Um, it was it was really cool. I would like to try to go to Alaska again to see it when it's brighter and there's less ambient light around. But that was that was really cool. So anyway, let's get with the feedback. <laughs> call from the United States of America. This episode was 124. So this was kind of a continuation of the Flying Fish Jade Dragon thing. In the first one, it was a setting. In the second one, it was a game system I came up with to, to run this campaign in. Our first feedback for this episode is from Jason again. Hey, Jason here, giving feedback on your latest Tectahedron RPG podcast episode uh, where you talk about the rule system for the Legend of the Flying Fish and the Jade Dragon, I think. Um, so I think you have too many skills, honestly. <laughs> Athletics, Daredevil, uh, what else, Stealth. I mean, a lot of those skills do the same thing, and I know you can use one instead of the other, but if Daredevil's like your default save against things, for quickness save, then why wouldn't you take Daredevil? Why would you take Athletics over Daredevil when you can just say, I'm going to use Daredevil and do that? So I, I think you can probably combine some skills, honestly. Um, also, the character seem, and, and maybe I'm, may, maybe I misheard this, you know, I'm listening in the car, but it sounds like you have a one skill, three, one and two, one at one, and then maybe one other one at one, and then you have like four at minus one. So the characters seem pretty inept, honestly, um, which might not be an issue. I mean, it'd be, we'd have to see it in play. Uh, rolling eight on 2D6 is, it isn't as easy as it seems always. But, you know, failure is not always a bad thing. That could be interesting. So I'm not arguing for super competent characters either. I, I just wonder if maybe there should be a couple more ones sprinkled in there, two sprinkled in there. But, I, again... It's hard to say without playing it. Overall, I really like what you've laid down. I think it's an interesting system, and I would definitely play it. Be interested to see how it plays out the table. Thank you for taking the time to explain it and talk about the system. I look forward to the feedback episode and hearing what James thinks about it. Take care. Hey, Jason, thanks for that. I paused because you said something at the very end that made me think oh, I don't have James's feedback here. Um, Mm. crud. <laughs> I, I don't know where it went. Because, you know, James and I are in constant communication. So we communicate, you know, email and chat and Discord. And his stuff comes in different ways rather than the normal feedback channel, um, which is something else I'll talk about in a second. So um, I will tell you that James really liked it when I did the voice. He's the only one that said anything about the voice. <laughs> Um, other, as for the rules themselves, he, he didn't say anything. Um, yeah. Um, too many skills. Interesting. I thought, actually, that's one of the reasons I said, let me do my own. Cause I thought that traveler had too many, you know, I was whittling down. I'm like, Oh, I have this standard skill list I use for things, you know, 
I first came up with the skill list uh, way back in the day when Decahedron was an RPG. Um, and it's a skill list I've used for this. I've just, if anything, I've whittled it down throughout the years. You know, GURPS has 400 skills. Oh. Yeah, that's interesting feedback. I, as for Daredevil versus Athletics, that's, in my mind, they are two very separate things. Uh, in essence, Athletics is strength and Daredevil is dex, in essence. Daredevil, if you say, you know, I want to lift this large boulder and I'm going to use my Daredevil, I'm going to say, no, that skill doesn't apply. If you say, I want to swim across these rapids, that's not really Daredevil. And so maybe I need a better name for Daredevil is what it really boils down to. Uh, its original name was acrobatics, you know, to split aside that two parts of the physical, uh, you know, your, your quickness versus your power. Um, yeah, interesting. Actually, I, I would like to have a chat with you about this. I'll, I'll send you a link to a blog post that has all these skills down. And yeah, at some point I renamed it Swashbuckling, but for this campaign, just to make it sound more like it. But yeah, maybe it's more of a naming thing than a too many thing. But yeah, we'll we'll chat offline if you're willing. Thanks. Under it's funny that you said the underpowered thing because even before your feedback came in, I was out running. Yeah, looking at me. You're a runner? Yeah, right. Nah, I, I really go out running. Um, I was out running and I, I was thinking about it. I'm like, it's not quite right. I I came to the same conclusion. And what I thought of maybe doing it instead was your crew position, whatever your crew is aboard the plane, you know, pilot, gunner, mechanic, radio man, or navigator. That's automatically a three. It's its own category. It's automatically a three. Bam. Done. And then to give people on top of that, one three, two twos, and three ones. And then, of course, the three negative ones. Um, that was the idea I came up with while running. What do you think of that one? Oh, but yeah, the funny thing is I, I was done running. I think your message came in either that very day or the next morning. I'm like, Jason, get out of my brain. <laughs> Uh, you said we'd have to see it and play. Play, Yeah, that's the thing with all the... No matter how something sounds in the head, it's not until it gets to the table and you see it running. Oh, you also said the thing about the, the getting eight isn't as easy as it sounds. Um, it's, a, it's a coin flip because I'm doing the doubles add and rollover. Oh, the doubles thing. The other thing I was thinking was the method of uh, critical success was too complicated. And so I'm thinking about just making it... If you roll two doubles... That's a crit. doesn't make a difference what the total is. So even roll snake eyes and snake eyes for four, <laughs> you still got a critical success. But if you roll that third double, which I would make you roll again if you roll two doubles, that is the fumble. And uh, yeah, the, the numbers, you know, you have a one in 36 shot. So that's going to be, uh, what, like a 3% chance of a crit? That's... Not quite as much as D and D. Uh, I'm I'm good with that, and um, the fumble will be one in two hundred and sixteen, which is fairly rare. So I, I like that. Oh, the other thing I left out from the game mechanic is that I use the miss by one thing. So if you get a seven, you have the chance of taking you you have the choice of taking a bad thing in order to convert that to a success. So. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's going to be as hard uh, to get that eight as you think, because, you know, seven could count as an eight as long as you're willing to accept a consequence. And uh, again, doubles adding rolling over. So if you roll a two, four, or a six the right way, you're going to get to re roll those anyway. So actually, so yeah, if you roll double threes, which is a six, no matter what you roll, that's going to be at least an eight. Because your next roll, even if it's a two, well, that's actually going to be a crit. So, yeah. Um, but again, as we have both said, have to see it in play. Thank you very much for that call, Jason. Our next one is from Merck the Meek. Hey, Joe, this is Merck. I enjoyed your last two episodes on the Jade Dragon. When you started describing the setting, instead of DuckTales, I immediately thought of Tailspin, which was another Saturday morning cartoon. And I was the right age for those cartoons at the time. So enjoyed that. And actually, 
because of Disney Plus, I was able to show the girls, I think it's like the first four episodes, which is almost like a, a full blown movie, cartoon movie that's just been divided up over four episodes. And yeah, you've got your, you know, your C biplane and uh the it it's an interesting mix of you know oldish technology but then there's there's like mo- almost more advanced type stuff so it gets into a little bit of sci-fi in some ways but still a fun setting and your your rule set sounds interesting it seems like it could be fun i i don't know like i don't think i can judge mechanics very well but it sounds like something that you could pick up fairly easy and and get playing real quick. So I'd be interested to try it once you have the rules out. I'm okay with you ditching attributes and just using the skills. It streamlines things, makes it simple, a little, frankly easier to, to work with, or at least it feels that way. Maybe in play it might be different, but if... I I don't know if you were envisioning like long term campaign play with this or if it's more of like, well, it, it seems episodic. It seems more. Yeah, like you're going for an episodic show and this, this seems like this rule set fits into that. So, yeah, I'm totally fine with the approach you've taken. And like I said, look forward to reading it and maybe giving it a try sometime. Thanks and take care. Thanks, Merck. By the way, Merck is also the host of a podcast. His podcast is called Merck the Meek. <laughs> uh, links down below. Yeah, you know what? I said DuckTales. I think I was thinking Tailspins. Even when I said it, I think if you listen, there might be a little pause in my voice because I'm like, wait, is that the right show? But I couldn't come up with Tailspin. I, I think I think that's actually the show I was thinking of. Um, is that the one with the, the duck with like the leather flight jacket? Um uh, I think maybe he wears a bomber hat. Yeah, anyway. Uh, and I didn't think the plane was a biplane. I thought it was just a seaplane. Uh, eh, I don't know. <laughs> fuzzy, fuzzy memories. My my youngest in this is in, in her 30s now, so it was a long time ago. Uh, skills only. Yeah, like I said, I would love to take credit for that idea. I got that from Stephen O'Sullivan in uh, Fudge. Uh, I think it's a great idea. It simplifies things. I can tell you from my experience, I have used it for years and years when I was running Fudge as my primary game. And it really does make things so much simpler, so much easier. Um, some players, you know, are very married to the, the attributes concept. Um, and you need to kind of get them to unlearn that. But once you do, it's it's great. Uh, as for campaign versus episodic, yeah, we just talked about that in the last one. That's great. Um, yeah, thanks for all your feedback. I, I appreciate it muchly, and uh, have a great one. Episode 126 was the next one. In that episode, I posed the question, do you want to know an NPC secret? And that's just like one example. It could be anything. Do you want to know stuff that your character wouldn't know? Like there's a lost legend of... The dragging of the blue forest and everyone has forgotten about it and it's about how this dragon lived well if everyone's forgotten about it how would you know it right so do you want to know about that stuff that that was the question i posed and we got some answers first answer was from evil jeff joe evil jeff all right the latest podcast you put out about Knowing an NPC secret, I want to go with no. I I don't think they should. I mean, if that was something that you were needing to learn about or something, I mean, I could see being part of an adventure, but needing to know it, I, I don't see where that's a thing. But I do feel and understand where James was coming from how he said it got him more immersed in the world by knowing the secrets. Because like reading, where we get to be privy to the inner dialogue of some characters and everything, that sort of secret and things they know, you know, it helps immerse you in the story and things like that, which makes it more alive. So I can see where some people may go, hey, when I know these secrets, it 
you know, I feel more into the game or into the world or whatever. So I can see where James is coming from on there. So I guess it really depends on the player. On average, I would say no, but there's probably going to be some who are like, hey, yeah, knowing a secret or two doesn't hurt. You know, you're the GM. You can figure it out. Later. Hey, Evil Jeff, thanks for that. It sounds like you and I are on the same uh, wavelength exactly. Uh, and James uh, just is on the other side. Uh, just the reason I posed the question because I had never even considered that. I'm like, why? Why would? Why would I tell the players something that they character wouldn't know? Which it, it doesn't make sense to my mind. Um, yeah, I just was wondering if I was the outlier there or if it was like a 50-50 thing or if James is a bit of an outlier. So I posed the question. I want to see how, how the answers came in. And so I, I appreciate what you said. Like, and I agree with what you said. You know, neither one of us is wrong. He's he's just looking at things differently. And you equated it to reading, and James is a big reader. And I know that he liked a lot of like the Forgotten Realm stuff. And he loves campaign worlds, like the box sets like Mistara and Red Sun, all those. He likes to devour those. And I wonder if in those, I wonder if in those they um, they give you things like that, you know, with, oh, this is the king of Grognardia and he secretly did whatever. I don't know. But then that's, that's different to be in a book like that, right? Because that the, that's for the GM, and the GM can use that to eh, whatever. I think the most interesting thing that you said, though, and you didn't actually say it outright, is that, uh, but I think it's what you're getting at, is that if you have information like that to present to the players, it should come out and play. It should be when the, the characters discover it. They could be a dusty clue they found in a chest in the dungeon, or it could be an NPC who who tells them this legend. Whatever, yeah, that's that's how I would do it. <laughs> Thanks for that, Evil Jeff. Next one is from Jason. Let's... Hey, this is Jason. Just listen to episode. Actually, I just watched episode ninety-seven on YouTube because you said the podcast was slightly edited down, so I didn't want to miss anything. So, I... excuse me, I switched over to YouTube. Sorry for the delay in reaching out. I've been sick down with the flu for a week. But my announcement was not an April Fool joke. I, I will throw that out there. That was not the intent. I Somebody else mentioned that to me as well. But if that was the intent, I would have put it out on the first. But if you do listen to the show or you did listen to the show, I would say that unsubscribing from my feed if you have my show going to a podcatcher, might be premature. Um, so let's leave it at that. Anyhow, great, great episode. I answered on YouTube, but I will say that I do not like to know secrets. If I'm a player, I would rather them revealed in play and have the joy of that revelation coming out during the game. I would much prefer that. I don't want to know those secrets, and I don't want to know those behind-the-scenes things as a player. Obviously, as a DM, you have to do that kind of thing. For Evil Jeff, Val Kilmer was in the Saint movie, the remake of The Saint, not in The Avengers. The Avengers did have Sean Connery as a bad guy, but sadly, he picked poorly when he chose that project. In the last comment I'll mention, you mentioned Die Hard, but is John McClane really an everyman? I don't know. He's, I would say he's the least... Uh, in D and D terms, he has a couple a couple levels under his belt, right? He's you know he's not a fresh out of the academy policeman, so he's at least third to fifth level is a policeman in that movie. Um, it's is he a low you know he's not Superman in that movie by any means. You're right, but he's definitely more competent than the average people out there, as we see as he you know goes through and takes out those terrorists. I'd be curious to think what you think his – you say everybody should have low stats, or not everybody should have, but you like characters that have low stats. And I like low stats, too. They're fun to play. What was John McClane's low stat, do you think, if we looked at it, say, in D&D terms? Because I'm, I'm not sure that he had one. Uh, maybe wisdom. Maybe. Uh, maybe intelligence. Those are really your only two options, and, and he 
he makes some pretty smart decisions and put things together pretty well. So he he makes some mistakes too, but maybe wisdom, I don't know, but he's pretty well rounded. Okay, talk to you later. Hey everyone. This is where the magic split happens. Everything you watched before now was recorded in an earlier session, and this is where I'm picking up. Hey, Jason, thank you for that. A lot of notes. I took a lot of notes on that one. All right. First thing was about edited down. Um, there's not a whole lot of difference. I don't do a whole, it's not an edit down of content. It's something like, uh, say when I was talking about the blood shit back in the Flying Fish Jade Dragon episode, and I wanted to show a picture of the blood shit on YouTube, which by the way, I did. Um, I might mention that while I'm recording and that I would cut out of the episode because it's frustrating to be listening on a podcast and hear the presenter talk about something that you can't see. You know, oh, and look at the blue color. Yeah, I didn't say anything like that, but you know, stuff like, always has driven me crazy when I've heard other people try this dual use uh, recording thing. So that's what I cut out of there. Content wise, it's otherwise all the same. So if you are more of a podcast listener than a YouTube watcher, you're, you're not missing anything other than the visuals, which if that's important to you, but I don't use a lot of those. Next, you said you had the flu. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that you had it. I'm glad that you're feeling better. Valerie just had um, a bout of something for about a week and she's just getting over it herself. So um, yeah, something's going around. You say it wasn't April's Fools. I, I will believe you. It was a good theory, like I said, when I first said it. Maybe it was just wishful thinking on my part, too. But you said don't unsubscribe. Well, funny story that I, I never unsubscribe. Well, that's not quite true. I often don't unsubscribe right away. Um, when a podcast goes away, I keep it. I mean, it doesn't hurt me to be on my feed. You know, my podcatcher will check it once a week. So maybe once a year, it's not my calendar or anything, you know, it's just, you know, when I feel like it, I'll look. And as long as the show has had an episode in the last year or two, I'll keep it on. If it hits three years, I'll definitely get rid of it. Uh, but yeah, a year, two years, maybe. If it's less than a year, I definitely keep it. If it's, you know, between the year and the two year mark, Maybe if it's over two years, yeah, that's, that's, I didn't subscribe then. But I did want to say, I do like, I do like the idea of ending a podcast definitively. The, the way normally it normally happens normally is pod fading, right? Uh, it's a weekly podcast and all of a sudden they skip a week, but then they back to normal. Yeah, well, that happens. People get sick. People have to travel, stuff like that. Uh, but then they skip two weeks and then they come back and then they skip, you know, a month or two and then they come back and they say, oh, yeah, sorry about that. Life was happening, but I'm back now. And they do like three or four episodes and then they disappear again. It's it's a phenomenon, a phenomenon called pod fading. And uh, I much prefer a, hey, I'm hanging it up. This is it. There's no more. Uh, over the pod fading thing. So I had much, much respect for you for that. You said that you don't want to know. Um, Evil Jeff said the same thing. I said the same thing. We're all on the same page. You added a note though about monsters saying that uh, you don't want to pretend that your character does it. You know, first level character doesn't know anything about monsters. Um, I, I've had actually people ask me this during play. Actually, James has asked me this during play. He's one of them. Um, which I always laugh and say, James is a munchkin, but this is a very non-munchkin player because he says, would my character know that trolls regenerate or you can use fire to prevent that? Something like that, you know, uh, stuff from the monster manual, whatever. And, you know, James has been playing role-playing games for 40 years. So he, as a player, knows these things. And so he's concerned about uh, metagaming and bringing that knowledge in. But the way I view it is that these characters live in this world and you're not the first character ever to come across a troll. You have heard legends and 
stories about other heroes coming in contact with trolls before. So anything that's in your memory, I'm not saying look it up in the book at the table, but anything that's in your memory as a player exists in your character's head as myth and legend. And yeah, I don't require them to to not know stuff. That's silly in my mind. Um, and you know, just because you know what the Monster Hill says about a troll, doesn't mean that you necessarily know how a troll works in my world. Plus, I'm one of those GMs I never say, you're facing a troll. I say you're facing this large leathery creature. It's about eight to nine feet tall with huge arms and a grayish green pallor to its skin. If you want to decide that's a troll, then treat it like a troll. If you want to think that's an ogre, treat it like an ogre. <laughs> You'll find out soon enough which one it really is. Or maybe it's none of the above. Maybe it's some monster of my own creation. You were talking about uh, Sean Connery when he picked that role for that movie. And you said he picked poorly. And I'm going to disagree with you there. <laughs> um, I saw Robin Williams on some talk show once. Don't remember what it was. But Robin Williams, you know, clearly this was a while ago because he was alive. And someone asked him, why would you do toys? That was such a horrible movie. And he just looked at the camera and he said, well, they paid me a couple million dollars. All right. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. So, you know, as, Sean Connery, as long as Sean Connery got paid and he didn't have to turn down any other job, he didn't pick poorly. He took home his money and, you know, he did his job. It's what a professional does. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you that he picked poorly. He, he, he's a professional. He got paid. John McClain. So, first of all, <laughs> just to clarify what you were saying in case this is the first time someone is listening to this. I don't say that character should have low stats. I say that a character should have at least one low stat, not every stat low. Something to add flavor or color. In a skill-based game, it could be a skill instead of a stat, of course. So you mentioned, you briefly said that John McCain, yeah, John McCain was not, John McClain was not, a every man in that he had some levels um and that's a very interesting thing that you said because just last week james and i had a conversation about almost this exact thing same thing actually it was spawned from the same comment so maybe that makes sense why and i think it's going to spawn off the whole episode i think i'm going to do an episode about it but it's the difference about levels versus stats right because as you said John McClain has some levels under his belt, but that doesn't mean he has high stats, right? You can still be an every man with expertise in your field. And I, that's what I would say that John McClain was in the first movie. By the time he's jumping over Harriers, we're in Ubermensch territory. Um, yeah. As for John McClain's low stat, clearly, I mean, I didn't even have to hesitate here. It's charisma. Nobody likes him. In the entire movie, not a single person likes him. Maybe the stewardess. Maybe. But that is it. <laughs> Nobody likes him. His, his wife doesn't like him. She moved halfway across the country to get away from him. She introduces him to people in the office. Not one of them likes him. The only person that likes him, like I said, maybe the stewardess. Maybe, oh, uh, the, the cop on the... The ground, which makes it almost a buddy film. Um, he likes him, but like his supervisor and everybody else, so nobody else likes him. He's the only guy. Not a single person likes John McClane. Uh, even his wife, Holly, at the end, uh, she's grateful, <laughs> but that's not the same as liking him. So now, charisma. John McClane's low stat is charisma. We, as an audience, like Bruce Willis. We, as an audience, sympathize with John McLean. But in that world, nobody likes him. Low charisma. The next message, it is from Riley. Riley is the host of the Digetic Advancement Podcast. And, uh, oh, great podcast. It's a gaming podcast, obviously. And he had this to say. Hey, Joe, Riley here. It's cool that you've moved the podcast over to YouTube and, and decided to add video. It'd be interesting to see what your um, viewership 
is it like between you know, podcasting and YouTube? I get a sense that there's more people consuming D and D content on YouTube than there are on on podcast apps. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if that actually pans out. I did have to watch to see what you're going to do for for Collins, uh, whether you're just going to sit there uh, silently <laughs> or actually put an image up. Uh, uh, I don't know if it would actually be as awkward as I might imagine, um, but but you, you've handled it well. On to your actual question. Uh, do you reveal NPC secrets to players? I'm going to say most of the time, no. I think the reason why NPCs have secrets is so that the players can perhaps discover them through play, right? Um, that's kind of the reward of play, being able to figure things out. Um, and so if you reveal all the secrets, that, that would kind of remove some of the fun of playing. Obviously, that's not <laughs> what James is suggesting or, or what you are, but um, I'm struggling to find cases where you would want to theoretically i kind of get the idea right i can see um where an npc with a secret that's not that important but does kind of sell the setting would be interesting to include in a setting guide you, know, you don't want to do that too much as i said you don't want to remove the fun um and then i'm thinking in like a campaign similar to Curse of Strahd, where it kind of focuses on a singular NPC. Um, it could be interesting to include some of their secrets, um, just to kind of get the players sold on the premise. You know, the characters don't aren't learning these secrets, but the players are, and that, that gets them to, to engage better. But that's theoretical. I'm not actually sure if that, that plays out. Um, I'm really interested to hear what uh, other people have to say on it, though. So I look forward to that. Um, Keep up the episodes, enjoying them. I'll talk to you later. Hi, Riley. Thank you for that call. Um, yeah, we're all on the same page now. Me, you, Evil Jeff, Jason. Uh, we don't want to know the NPC secrets. Uh, as I think I said in the call, <laughs> responding to Evil Jeff, I think it's James does a lot of books and stuff. And he loves reading campaign books like um, the Forgotten Realms stuff. Is it Forgotten Realms? Greyhawk, maybe? I don't know. What's the one with the little draw with two weapons i don't know i never read any of the D, D fictionalized stuff but james consumes them like uh like it's food and um i think when he jumps into a setting he wants that kind of thing also again apologize if i'm repeating this um also i think there's a certain sense maybe in putting in a gm guide so the gm knows what is happening um, but for the player's consumption, no. So that's me. We all seem to be on the same page. Uh, the other thing you talked about, Riley, was, uh, be interested to see the YouTube numbers versus the podcast numbers. I can tell you that they're already kind of close. So of course, the first time on YouTube, there's going to be a little bit of a bump, right? There's going to be, you know, cause I send it to a bunch of my friends. I say, Hey, look, I'm on YouTube now and uh, stuff like that. So that's going to be a little bump. So I expect that to come down. Uh, there will probably be a few people migrating from the podcast over to YouTube. So I would expect that to have an equalizing factor. I do agree with you that I think there's a bigger audience on YouTube. I think there's an even bigger audience on TikTok. I just don't know if I could get myself down to that 10 minute frame. And I don't know what's going to happen with TikTok with the US law thing. So uh, interesting. Oh, and as for calls, uh, yeah, the way I do it now works because so far every caller has been a podcaster so I can use their, their artwork. Uh, I have another thing planned for emails, which you're going to see in a little bit because I have an email from Merck for episode 127, um, which I like a little better. And I've toyed with the idea of doing that for, it's pretty much going to be the text typing across screen, kind of like I did for episode 127 for the captain's log. Um, I thought about doing that for the voice messages, but the idea of, ooh, of typing all that in really rubs me the wrong way. Uh, transcribing someone's uh, voicemail. Yeah, I, I don't see myself doing that. I could take the one that Google provides, you know, they call into the, the, the number. Um, and that's sometimes funny how hilariously wrong it is. Uh, for example, once Daniel from the Bandit's Keep called me, and he usually says, this is Daniel from Bandit's Keep. And it, <laughs> the transcription said, hi, Joe, this is Daniel Craig. <laughs> 
I'm like, wow, James Bond is calling me. But no, it was Daniel from Bandit's Keep. But um, yeah, I have an, a yet another idea where I'd use like uh, little miniatures or maybe Star Wars figures or something uh, on screen and do them. Or maybe I was thinking of making like little PNG tubes for each individual caller, but I am not that artistic. I couldn't do that. Um, so, so yeah, there's all these ideas, but um, time, talent come into play. So anyway, thanks for the call, Riley. Uh, we're going to move on now to episode 127. In episode 127, I presented an idea that I had uh, for a Star Trek adventure. And I presented it in the format of a Traveler supplement called 76 Patrons. It was 70, uh, supplement six for the original Traveler, which is a format I love. We have three pieces of feedback. The first one is from James. And James, this was uh, an email feedback. James said, I like the idea of your Star Trek adventure, but why not Star Wars or Battlestar Galactica? Thanks for that, James. Yeah, I know you're, you're being low tongue in cheek. You won't be entirely serious. Um, but why? I, there is a reason, at least for Star Star Wars, because I thought about that when I was doing this. So this would work for Star Trek. This would work if you wanted to do it in the world of the Orville, which I really like the world. The, the Orville universe. It's actually not a bad show. I, I'm not a fan of... Uh, a lot of Seth MacFarlane's humor, but I also understand that it, at least in the first season or two, he was required to put more of that in there than he wanted to by the lawyers because they were really afraid of uh, being sued by Paramount. And so they added more than was. So maybe if it was with his original vision, I would have been, I would have been more okay with it. But the science fiction is so good that it's easy, easy to overlook those little bits and go with what you like. It's a really great show. And in many ways, I'm almost thinking that Shirts and Skirts could be a uh, an Orville RPG. Anyway, so um, the adventure I had, the, the Silent Siren, um, would definitely work for Star Trek. Of course, that's what I designed it for. It would definitely work for Orville. Um, it would probably work for Galaxy Quest, too, the more I think about it. <laughs> Why not Star Wars, though? The reason it wouldn't work for Star Wars is because there is no Prime Directive in Star Wars. And the Prime Directive is a major complication and driving factor for that plot. Um, so you would say that they were the rebels, you know, that they're part of the Rebel Alliance that is going to this planet and that it's on the border with the Empire. The Empire doesn't care whether or not that planet gets corrupted. And we've never seen anything about the rebels uh, saying, no, we can't corrupt these Ewoks or whatever. Um, no, we just don't. And so that takes that whole leg out of it. And the adventure becomes less interesting because of the lack of that complication. Battlestar Galactica, virtually the same reason. Um you also don't have something like the Klingons in Battlestar. What you have is the the Cylons. And of course, again, the Cylons view their mission just to eliminate anything that's not Cylon. So they would just go down the planet. planet. Maybe you could make that interesting because then the fleet would want to take uh, the people down below to save them from the Cylons that they know are on their tail. Uh, but then you don't need the whole artifact and everything, right? It's just going to be someone that they encounter on their way to looking for Earth. Although the artifact could be a clue for the location of Earth, and maybe they'd have to destroy it. Actually, James, this might work for Battlestar Galactica. It, it needs a little bit of tweaking, but it might work. Hmm. Interesting. Thanks for that, James. Uh, the next one was just a YouTube comment from Jason. And Jason said, great pitch, or." Pitches. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I'm a Star Trek guy. You know, I, I like Star Trek. Um, it's interesting. All the feedback for this episode was written. I, I don't know what that is. The next one was from Merck the Meek, and this was an email. And Merck said, oh, by the way, <laughs> Merck the Meek is, his real name is Michael. He goes by either, depending on his mood. He is the host of the Merc the Beak podcast, uh, another gaming podcast. He talks about role-playing games and other games, and he has a particular focus about playing with his family. Um, 
taking these gaming experiences and sharing them with his wife and his two daughters. He has two young daughters. And sometimes he gets them on the show and that's so adorable and it's so charming and uh, I love it. It's a really awesome, awesome show. Uh, anyway, Merck said, I enjoyed your Star Trek adventure episode. Both your ideas and the one from the Patreon book are so flavorful. I wouldn't mind doing a review of the book if you have me. Regardless, I'm enjoying your ideas. Take care. Hey, Merck, Michael, whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you like them. Uh, yes, yeah, 76 Patreons, like I said, it's a great book. I love that book. Um, and yes, I will have you. Um, yeah. And so I've been talking to Merck off lying he's picked up the book he didn't have it previously it's available on drive through rpg and he has bought it for the grand total of six dollars and uh he's going through it now and we're currently working on a date and we thought we had one but valerie and i decided hey we haven't gone whale watching in a couple years let's go down to massachusetts and, and look at the whales so um the date we had picked <laughs> we're going to be in Massachusetts watching whales. I love whale watching. We do that every few years. We also go down to uh, Pennsylvania. There's a place there called Elk County where you lots of uh, big population of elk. They were all destroyed originally as, you know, the <laughs> as Americans are wont to do. Uh, but as we are also wont to do, we are trying to repair what we've done in the past and uh, they've taken elk population from out west and resettled them in the area years ago and they've taken root and it's pretty cool and i generally like to go there august september ish time frame because the elk are in rut and so the males you know lock their antlers and everything and i love that and i love taking my camera and going there and taking pictures of that it's really really cool so anyway i'm going off on a tangent <laughs> uh, so there will be an upcoming episode it will be on camera this will be my first camera to camera interview episode um, we will be reviewing Traveler Supplement 6 76 Patrons uh, the original uh, Mongoose has a version called 760 Patrons which I haven't seen I, anybody have it? should I buy it? would I be interested? let me know <laughs> um, I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking that uh, Carl might have it because he's a big Traveler fan. Carl, do you have 760 patrons from Mongoose? Would I like it? Let me know. Anybody else? Let me know. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for that, Merck. Okay. And we are all caught up. This is our last message. Uh, it's from Jason. It's about the last interview I did. Well... The last interview from your point of view is <laughs> the first half of this feedback episode. The one before that was an interview with Chris Goderman of Basic Fantasy and Iron Falcon fame. A really great interview. I really appreciated him coming on. Thanks again, Chris. Uh, this is what Jason had to say. Hey, Jason here. Great interview with Chris Goderman. Really appreciate you taking the time to record that and ask him all those great questions. I'm glad I didn't send any in because you covered pretty much everything that needed to be covered. Great job. Uh, I look forward to what you do next. Take care. Talk to you soon. Hey, Jason. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so if you're watching this on YouTube and you don't know what he's talking about, I wasn't able to do video for that episode. So if you go look on the audio side, you'll see it there. Speaking of which, I'm going to stop putting the audio-only episodes up on YouTube. YouTube is only going to have the video episodes because they're both in the same feed. And so they're showing up twice. I think that's confusing people. And the audio episodes don't have a lot of listeners there. I think there's about three. So I think it makes sense this way. So if you're listening on audio, actually, I'll make a separate YouTube video uh, audio release just for that uh, a little short one. Yeah, uh, Jason, thank you for those comments. He was a great guest. He gives great answers. I did think of one or two questions, you know, while I was running, uh, listening to the episode. Well, yeah, earphones, that's what that is. <laughs> anyway, uh, while I was running and listening to the episode, but I've forgotten them since. So, uh, yeah, it was. I, I thought it was a really good episode, if I do say so myself. Um, but, yeah, thanks for the comments. And that is it. We are all caught up with feedback. Yay! <laughs> um, 
So next time we will go back to regular event, uh, regular gaming content. I have some ideas. I want to do something with uh, James. James is very, very camera shy. So not sure how I'm going to do this. I don't think a whole episode using an image, a static image for him would, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, if you have any ideas, let me know. Again, thanks for listening. Do share your feedback. As you can tell, I love getting feedback. I love responding to feedback. I think it brings us together as a community. Best way to leave feedback is if you're on YouTube, put it in the comments down below. A lot of times I will type you a response right there. Other ways are, of course, the feedback line, which is 562-774-2278. And that's 562-RPG-CAST. Or you can just email me, feedback at decahedron.k, spelled decahedron with a K. Um, yeah, there's other ways. They're all in the show notes or in the box below if you're on YouTube. Thanks again for listening. Until next week, happy gaming, happy life. Bye.